field of wildflowers and in full bloom and their beauty. And you're amazed at the wonder of God's creation. You know, we stand in awe and wonder of God. And God speaks to us through what he has created. And God reveals himself through the works of his hands. You know, according to Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, it says that the heavens, and when he says the heavens there, he's referring to the sun, the moon, and the stars, the heavenly bodies. He says that the heavens constantly reveal their creator. And it reads there, it says that, Heavens, and notice there it says the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Notice that the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse, the expanse of the universe, is declaring, declaring the work of his hands. And it says day to day pours forth speech. You know, we look at the sun moving through the sky, and we see how it lights up everything around us and warms us. So it tells of God's glory. And it says, night to night reveals knowledge. We look at the stars and the moon and how they move about and change and, and then their expanse and just the wonder of the universe. And that gives us knowledge. You know, it's almost as though the whole creation is shouting at you. It's almost as though the whole creation is shouting at the human race. You know, it's the heavens both give glory to God and they reveal knowledge to those who have the sensitivity to listen to such things. You know, um, I wonder, when I was reading this psalm, I, I wondered if uh, the Apostle Paul may have had this psalm in mind as he wrote the words of Romans 1 and chapter, verse 20, Romans 1 verse 20, when Paul makes the case that the whole human race is without excuse, for each of us should know God. We can't claim ignorance of God. In fact, he writes there in Romans 1.20, he says, For since the creation of the world, his, or God's, invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. You know, King David, who penned this psalm, notes that there is no audible voice, but the creation still speaks. In, in Psalm 19, verse 3, he observes this. He says, there are no, there's no speech, there are no words. Their voice is not heard. Speak, speaking of the, the heavens, the heavenly bodies, their voice is not heard. Yet, continuing then in chapter 19, verse 4, it says there, uh, the sun, the moon, and the star, their, their line, or it, it could be translated their voice or their sound, has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. The creation, the heavens themselves, speak to us, and their coverage is complete, and you can't miss it. You can't escape the glory of God that's being proclaimed by the creation. Their voices cannot be ignored. And though there is no audible voice, they speak loudly and clearly of their creator. They show us the glory of God. Of God Almighty. And they reveal to us God. They reveal the creator to us. You know, when some people look at the sky, they see only the sky. When some people look at the stars and the moon and the sun, they see only those things. They see nothing beyond. And when they look at such wondrous things, they are not brought to contemplate about their place in the universe. However, for those who are sensitive to such things, we look into the night sky, gaze into the night sky, we stand in awe of the glory of God. You know, David appeals to the example of the sun. In poetic language, 
David notes how the sun seems to disappear as if into a tent at night when the sun sets. And in the morning, the sun gloriously emerges like a bridegroom come bursting out of his tent. And like a strong warrior, like a strong man, the sun courses across the sky during the day. Now, one thing I just should note here, David didn't intend this to be a scientific explanation of why the sun rises and sets. It's very poetic language here. But I want you to notice that last line, that line in, in chapter, uh, Psalm 19, verse 6. It says, in part, nothing, talking about the sun, nothing is hidden from its heat. Nothing is hidden from its heat. So God, through the creation, is constantly revealing himself to us. When we cannot escape the voice of creation as it proclaims to us the glory of God. And nothing, in the same way as nothing is hidden from the heat of the sun, everybody living on this earth can hear the phrases of God, the phrases of creation, if they but listen. You know, God is the one who makes himself known to us. It's not that there's, that there's not just that there's a God, but God wants to be known. God wants to be known by you. So the creation, he has the creation saying his praises. But God has also revealed himself, has disclosed himself in the word, in the Bible. Now, it may not be entirely accurate for me to say, but one author has commented that the heavens tell of the glory of God, but they do not tell of his will. So the heavens reveal the glory of God, but we find God's will revealed here in his word. You know, the Lord's will is revealed in his word. So if we listen to the testimony of creation, again, as we go out to the night sky and we're just, just in awe and amazement of the creation of God, we should also be drawn to know the God who created it. We should, in turn, be drawn to his revealed word. God wants you to know him. God wants you to know him. You know, um, God does not intend to be a secret. God does not want to be a mystery to you. God wants to be known by you. And so David, the composer of this psalm, turns his attention to the word of God, then starting in Psalm 19, verse 7. And we have this shift in testimony from the creation itself that gives glory to God to the word of God. You know, in, in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9, we have six what we could call poetic sayings about the word of God. Now it's interesting here in this, these poetic sayings, it talks about the word of God in various ways. If you just look through those, starting in verse 7, it talks about the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the pre precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, which is derived from the word of God, also the judgments of the Lord. And then it says, the word, the word of God is. And so if you just notice here, it says the law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? It says restoring the soul. It fixes what's wrong. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. So if we we're ignorant of the things of God, God will give us wisdom through his word. The precepts of the Lord are right, and they rejoice the heart. They rejoice the heart. One thing I was thinking about this, you know, there's a lot of things that the world tries to get us to do, temptations we have, and 
And when we do things that are wrong, we're left with a guilty conscience, aren't we? But since the precepts of the, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. When you do the Lord's will, when you obey the, the Lord, there is no guilty conscience. There's nothing that's going to weigh down on you. Because you'll feel good about it. You know, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It opens the eyes to the world. The fear of the Lord, I like this, the fear of the Lord is clean, clean, enduring forever. It doesn't end. Those promises that God gives us doesn't end. You know, things of this world are very temporary, but the fear of the Lord endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They're righteous altogether. You know, we have to remember that these words were David's own testimony about his walk with the Lord. And as, as so, they are deeply personal words that, 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 that David penned here. And it's what he has learned about God. It's what he's come to understand about the Word of God. And something that is very basic here is that every human being is a sinner. Every person in this room is a sinner. I'm sorry to tell you that. Every person in this room is a sinner. Every person listening online is a sinner as well. You know, we have sinned against God. We have broken his laws and we have trampled his word. We have rebelled against God. Our sins have separated us from God. Our sins have alienated us from God. Our sins have sent us off in a trajectory away from God. And at the same time, we know this, that sin often takes us down all the wrong roads. We live in ignorance. And we live in self-deception often. Sin, though it promises us happiness, actually takes us away from happiness. And our sins are often lost and without direction, without purpose, and without hope. As sinners, we, we seem to kind of grope around in the dark, trying to find our way. Sin destroys relationships. We know that, our relationship with God and sometimes our relationship with others. Sin takes us away from life itself. Sin is ultimately self-destructive. And in this hopeless situation, it's God who has shined a light. It is his, his is the voice of reason. It is the word of salvation that we have here. And so God purposely reveals himself to sinners like you and me. And that is an act of pure grace. That is an act of pure mercy. And even though the human race has walked away from God, God constantly speaks to us in his creation. And God is not content to lose us. He's not content to lose you. God is not content to let us destroy ourselves. God in his word is giving us the way to salvation. So the word of God shows us the way to life and to happiness and to wholeness and to a relationship with our Creator. And so this word that we find here is not just any word. The word of God, as David describes, is that which recreates and transforms human lives. And for these reasons, David joyfully proclaims concerning the word of God here in Psalm 19, verse 10. He says, yes, he says, they're more desirable than gold. Yes, much more than fine gold. You know, so we have here like a, like a, you think about a miner who's out searching for gold and he gets skunked over and over again. He just can't find the gold. And finally, he strikes it rich. So this is how David understands the value of the word. Like a starving man who happens upon some honey, he shouts that the word of God is sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And so when we think about this, we live in a world full of sugar, don't we? 
we can eat get sugar anytime we want, you know. And we have all the, the corn syrup that they sweeten things with and all that. And we, we have all the sweet stuff. So we might not understand that back in those times, that honey was a wonderful treat. It was a mouthful of sweetness that was highly prized. So let us not take for granted the value of God's word in our lives. In Psalm 19, verse 11, David writes of the words of God. He says, by them, he says, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So, you know, as we journey through life, you know, each of us are going to make many decisions. We'll be faced with a multitude of choices. Some choices that we make will bring us blessings, while others will bring us nothing but heartache. And you, those of you who are like me who have a few miles on your tires, you know, over time, you know the choices you've made that have brought you happiness and blessing. And you also know the choices you've made that brought you heartache. So, but we listen, if we listen, if we listen, the Word of God will warn us of those dangers, will warn us of those pitfalls. And if we listen, the Word of God will lead us to lasting rewards and blessings of life eternal. You know, the word has more value than the finest of gold and the sweetest of honey. And the thing is that the Father wants you to know the way. He doesn't want to make it a secret. He's given us plain instruction. God doesn't rejoice when you fail. That's why he's given the word to us. You know, as we come to the close of Psalm 19, David, if you think about it, he considers the glory of God in creation, the sun, the moon, and the stars. As he considers the word of God, which has made such a difference in his life. As he considers also, though, his own faults and failings. I think David, and I think as we should too, there's a sense when you look at the glory of God and you look at the word and sometimes you see how you haven't measured up. You almost get the sense of this total sense of unworthiness to stand before the Lord. Now David, as an individual, is led here to consider his place before Almighty God. And I hope in some ways as we look at this psalm and consider it ourselves, we, we are brought to that place. We think about how do we stand before God today? You know, God reveals his glory in creation, and God reveals his will in the Bible so that we as individuals might come to him, that we might find that path that leads to his door. Now, David, in the presence of God, becomes keenly aware of his own sins and shortcomings. I want you to listen again to the heartfelt words of verses 12 and 13. And he says this. He says, who can discern his errors? Who can discern his errors? Basically, you know, he's, David's realizing he's a sinner. You know, I think he's thinking, you know, I've done things wrong that I didn't even know that I did stuff wrong that I don't even realize that I did it wrong. You know, I don't know, I don't know about you, but now I'm 56 years old. I can look back at my life, and there are times I thought I did something that was right and did the right thing, but over the years I realized that I've done the wrong thing. Have you ever had that experience where you realize that, yeah, I did that wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I had a bad attitude. I thought I had the right attitude. And that's why David continues here, acquit me of my hidden faults. Basically, Lord, forgive me of those things I did wrong I didn't even know I did wrong. And he also says here, also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. What's a presumptuous sin? 
that's something we do that's wrong. We knew it was wrong. Okay, so there's things that we do that are wrong. We don't really realize they're wrong. And then there's things that we do that are wrong that we knew they were wrong. So he says, keep me back from those things. And he says, look, there, he says this. Let them not rule over me. You know, like in the Lord's Prayer, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And then he continues here in Psalm 19. Then he says to the Lord, then I will be blameless. I shall be acquitted or forgiven of a great transgression. So David as he's aware of his own sins and shortcomings, lays them all out before God. He seeks forgiveness. He repents of his sinful ways. He acknowledges his weaknesses, and he pleads for God's strength that he could overcome these things. Most importantly, as we read this passage, we see that David is brought into a close relationship with the Lord. He renews his commitment to the will of God. He puts his trust in the creator of the heavens and the earth. And it continues here in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And he says, O Lord, my rock and my God reveals himself so that we might know him. God reveals himself so that we might be saved, that we might come and find the rock of our salvation, that we might find our true redeemer. And I think it's interesting in this psalm, I just want to consider it for a moment in maybe a literary sense, but also maybe, maybe in our personal goes from the very beginning to considering the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars and the vastness of God's creation. And it comes down then to our relationship with the Lord. And even though God created all these things, God is interested in you. The creator of all these things is interested in you. He's revealing himself to and in his word because he wants you to know him and find him that you would not be ignorant of him that you would he would not be a secret to you or a mystery to you but that you would know him and finally proclaim finally proclaim O Lord my rock and my redeemer so it's not about what the rest of the world is doing today. There's people out there being active, doing all kinds of stuff out there today. There's all kinds of plans for the rest of the day, you know. But right now, it's about you and it's about the Lord. You know, it's all about you and the Lord. The Lord wants you to know him. 